Theater presents Jeanette McDonald and Barry Sullivan. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Dotted Line, starring Barry Sullivan. And now, here is your hostess, Jeanette McDonald. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win the peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Now to our transcribed drama, The Dotted Line, starring Barry Sullivan as Wayne. All that was needed was a signature, just a few marks with a pen, and a man's life would have been saved. But only one person in the world could make those marks, a very special person, the President of the United States. I shall call myself Mr. Cromer because there are some facts about this episode that I'm not permitted to reveal, and one of them is my true identity. But the important thing is not so much when or where this took place, or even the real names of the people or countries involved. What matters is that we live in a world where it could happen at all. A world that needs a lot of fixing. My part in the incident began one night at the National Airport in Washington, D.C., during a time when Americans were fighting and dying in distant lands. The air sick goes, Cromer? Yeah. They never do any good. Any questions? No, I think I understand most of it. I remember. You're a commercial attaché. With the Middle East trade delegation, I've got it. That means you're diplomatic personnel, so don't stand for any nonsense about that pouch you carry. Uh, you think there's likely to be any? Never know. There's always some eager customs official or a nervous policeman, but whatever comes up, use your passport. All right. Yeah. It's like it's time for you to get aboard. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Starr. I, you know, I must confess, I still don't understand why a regular White House courier wasn't picked for this job. You know what you've got in that pouch. Yeah. That's the main reason. Have a nice trip, Mr. Cromer. It was a few minutes past 11 when the four-engine military transport lifted from the runway and climbed into the night, banking east toward the Atlantic. Far below, I could see the jagged strand of the Potomac River shining in the moonlight. I looked at the leather portfolio in my lap. Ten years an executive in the import-export business, and it turned out I'd come to Washington to run errands. At 10 o'clock the following morning, we put down at the Azores to refuel. And nine hours later, I was sitting in the main lounge of a hotel on Lisbon's Avenida de Liberdad, talking to an American correspondent for one of the wire services. Oh, come on now, Mr. Cromer. Uh, Joe, Joe, that's all there is to it. I was attached at the last minute to the Middle Eastern delegation, and I'm just catching up with them. Yeah, well, then how come you've got a diplomatic passport? Huh? <laughs> is that what I've got? That's what you've got. At least that's what you flashed at customs. Joe... Joe, in the first place, there's no story, or I'd give it to you. It's not just a story I'm after. Secondly, I don't know much about passports, but my understanding is that a commercial attaché has diplomatic status, so maybe that's why they gave it to me. Yeah, except that when the rest of that trade delegation came through ten days ago, all they had were consular passports. Now, what makes you so special? <laughs> I can't imagine, Joe. All right. Suppose I just do a little adding, and you stop me when I make a mistake. Meaning what? Two and two. The president's been out of the country since Tuesday. Uh, don't worry, it's official. Came over the wires half an hour ago. Well, what of it? Yeah, that was the wrong question, Mr. Cromer. You should have said, where is he? Now, look here, Joe. But apparently, I... you already know. Now, look, you haven't any basis for that conclusion. This is yeah. off the record, just a private conversation. All right. The president left the country Tuesday. Now, what's that got to do with me? 
Two days later, yesterday afternoon at 4 o'clock, Congress passed a special piece of legislature, the Babroyadov Asylum Act. Yeah, I, I think I heard something about it on the radio. Okay, okay, so all you know is what you hear on the radio, mm -hmm. huh? But it's a fact that being technically an undesirable alien, Babroyadov can't be admitted to the United States until the president signs that bill and makes it law. Uh -huh. I believe that's right. In your mind, if I also believe it's right that you've got a copy of that bill in your briefcase for the president's signature. Joe, even if you were right and a special courier had been selected to deliver that bill to the president, it would still be a routine mission. Not be so sure of that. It's simply to get around a technicality. Congress plans to adjourn sometime next week. If the president doesn't sign the bill within the next 10 days, it won't become law. But as everyone knows, he wants it to become law, so hence the high-class errand boy. Mr. Cromer, are you that errand boy? Well, what if I am? It's important, Mr. Cromer, are you? Yes. How soon do you expect to see the president? Sometime in the next few days. Rumor has it he's on a battle cruiser somewhere near Gibraltar. I honestly wouldn't know. You've been in touch with the American embassy since you got here? Just by phone. Speak to the ambassador? Well, he wasn't in, but I'm expecting a call any minute. Joe, what's it all about? The Finns have just canceled but by a Duff's visa. Oh, you're kidding. Hm, wish I was. I talked long distance less than an hour ago to the bureau chief in Helsinki. But by a Duff's gone until midnight tonight to find another country that'll take him. Otherwise, he goes back behind the iron curtain. Oh, no, I can't believe it. They agree. They agreed to keep him. Oh, sure, sure. But the big bear growled. And they know how he can scratch. Uh, you can't very well blame him. No, oh, I suppose not. Plus which, they've stuck their necks out already. He's in their country illegally. But if Baboyadev were to request asylum in the American legation for a day or so... It's already been thought of. Immigration people took him in custody last night. In grief. Yeah. This time of the year, the heat up there must be terrific. Yeah. That's why your mission isn't so routine anymore. I don't see that it alters things, but... Mr. Cromer. As of now, that piece of paper in your briefcase is the only chance Boyadov's got. Well, it's simply a case of my getting it to the president in the next seven hours. Yeah, but that works both ways. How do you mean? With the people who want Boyadov back. Simply a case of seeing that you don't. I glanced down at my watch. It had been almost two hours since I called the embassy and spoke to the charge d'affaires. He assured me the ambassador would have returned by six. It was now ten of seven. Gavin had a little grin on his face. I must have looked rather piqued. Mr. Cromer, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you. That's all right, Joe. I'm glad you told me. Look, I, I got an idea. Why don't I give you a lift over to the embassy? Then the whole thing's in their lap, huh? Hey, you know, that's not a bad idea. I... I suppose by now they know about Beboyadov's visa being cancelled. Well, if they don't, you can tell them. I'll, I'll just go upstairs. Listen, and would you mind I... checking with your office once more, just to make sure the story's official? Well, not at all. I don't want to make a fool of myself. I understand. Uh, you wait here. I'll, I'll be down before you can smoke a cigarette. I won't move. Uh, cigarette. It's not a bad idea either. Paging, hey, Mr. Wayne Cromer. Paging, Mr. Wayne Cromer. Over here, boy, over here. Mr. Wayne Cromer? Yeah, that's right. Telephone call for you, sir. A moment while I plug in the instrument. There you are, sir. Thanks. Uh, here you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hello? Mr. Cromer? You speaking? This is Miss Almada, Mr. Bracken's secretary at the embassy. Yes. The ambassador has not returned yet. There have been some sudden developments in the past few hours. Yes, I, uh, I think I know what you mean, Miss Almada. For that reason, a car is being sent to your hotel to pick you up and bring you back here immediately. Fine, that's, that's very good. But meantime, you must stay in your room. Well, I'm not in my room just now. I'm in the lobby. Then you are to go there immediately and stay there. These are express instructions from the ambassador. Very well. And you are not to answer the phone or open the door for any reason. All right, but how will I know when the people from the embassy... It is now four minutes to seven. In exactly 15 minutes, a piece of embassy stationery with my last name written on it, Almada, A-L-M-A-D-A, -A -A, mm -hmm. will be pushed under your door by the man who is to drive you back here. Okay. Under no conditions must you admit anyone else. Don't worry, I won't. 15 minutes, Mr. Cromer. I'll be ready. Very well. Goodbye. Bye. Boy, oh boy. Oh, young fellow, 
You are finished on the phone, Mr. Cromer? Yes, thanks, yeah. Very well, sir. And by the way, son, I, um, I'm going out, and I'd like to... I'd like you to give a message to the girl on the switchboard. Yes, sir? Uh, tell her that if a Mr. Joseph Gavin asks for me or tries to call my room that I've... Uh, I've had to go out for a while, and if there's anything he wants me to know, would he leave a note at the desk? You got that? Um, if Mr. Joseph Gavin calls, you are out, and leave a note at the desk. I waited until the bellhop had crossed the lobby, and then I walked quickly to the bank of elevators. My room was on the ninth floor at the west end of the hotel, overlooking the river Alcantara. It was dark now, and I could see the lights along the Rua Augusta stretching away toward the paved square of the Raccio. I sat down to wait. And at exactly 11 minutes past seven, I heard a piece of paper being slipped under my door. Yes? My name's Sandmeyer, Mr. Cromer. Your car's down in front. Oh, pleased to meet you. Uh, should I check out of the hotel now? No, no, we can take care of that later for you. Oh, uh... Bring the portfolio, of course. Right here. Fine. We better be going. The elevator was crowded with people, and it made at least three stops before we got to the main floor. Sandmeyer stood in front of me all the way down, a husky, light-haired man of about 30 who looked like he could handle most anything. But I was still mighty relieved when we stepped out into the lobby and started for the front door. Mr. Cromer! Mr. Cromer! Yes, sir, we're in a pretty big rush. Yeah, this won't take a minute. Mr. Cromer, this is a note from the Mr. Gavin you said might call. We thought you were not in. That's all right, son. In this envelope. Uh, thanks very much. Here you go. Thank you, sir. Much obliged to <laughs> Yeah, that kid's really in business. Mr. Cromer, look, you're my responsibility. Okay, okay, I'll read it in the car. Now, here we are. Get in, Mr. Cromer. Oh, I... I am Miss Almada. I didn't expect you'd be alone. Yes, the ambassador returned to the embassy a few moments after our phone conversation. Good, good. But, of course, there was no way of calling you back. Say, that's right. I wouldn't have answered if you had. The point is, arrangements have been made for you to complete your mission tonight. Tonight? It is not a difficult matter, you may think. The personage you are to contact is scarcely 300 miles from here. On a battle cruiser? Yes, that is my understanding. A seaplane, a... B-B-Y, I think you call them, will be waiting for you, just a few miles west of here. Good enough. And knowing from experience the way that Mr. Sandmeyer drives, we should be there in no time. The car pulled away from the hotel and started up the Avenida de Libertad. I set the portfolio on the floor next to my feet and leaned back to enjoy the ride. The windows were down and a sharp, stale breeze blew in from the ocean. We'd been driving for about five minutes when I remember the note from Joe Gavin the bellboy had given me. I fished the envelope out of my pocket and tore it open. Is anything wrong, Mr. Cromer? Uh, you no, know, no, it's just a note from a newspaper friend of mine. I, I said I'd have lunch with him tomorrow. Well, perhaps you can if you come back this way. I folded up the note and put it back in my pocket. My hands were shaking as I reached down for the portfolio and laid it across my lap. Gavin's handwriting was large and the note had been short. Dear Mr. Cromer, the Babaya Duff visa cancellation has been officially verified. I tried to reach your embassy for comment but was informed their phone had been out of order since 5 o'clock. Good luck, Gavin. We drove on through the night and I tried to fit the pieces together. If Gavin couldn't phone the embassy, then the embassy couldn't phone me. So Miss Almada was lying, and Mr. Sandmeyer was not what he seemed. And there might very possibly be a seaplane bobbing in the surf off the coast, but it, it certainly wasn't pointed toward Gibraltar. And neither, in that case, was my unsigned copy of the Baboya Def Asylum Act. Yeah. I could try to bluff them. I could say that another copy of the bill could be flown to the president in time to beat the deadline and save Mr. Nikolai Baboya Def. Yeah, maybe it could. Uh, but my making such a statement at this point would practically rule out the saving of Mr. Wayne Cromer. Uh, it had to be something else, something, something in character. Something that only a bumbling American businessman would be likely to do in a high-priority situation like this. 
Say, you know, this is a beautiful city, Miss Almada, just beautiful. You like Lisbon, Mr. Cromer? Love it, always loved it. Used to come here in the old days. Oh? Yeah, before the war. Made a lot of friends. Import, export, that's my line. You must find that very interesting. I love it. Can't wait to get back to it either. You know, sometimes this government stuff can be a lot of nonsense, you know. No offense, San Maya. No, not at all. I guess someone has to do it. Uh, you been with the department long? All five years. That's mm, five more than I could stand. No, nothing personal. Of course not, I understand. Well, you either, Miss Almada. It is quite all right, Mr. Cromer. But I mean, well, now you just take us. Take this mission as an example. As an example of what? My duplication of effort. Triplication, for that matter. Here we are, three of us, three of us doing a job a Western Union delivery boy could handle. I think perhaps you have a tendency to oversimplify things, Mr. Oh, Cromer. Oh, sure, sure. On the surface, we're all pretty well occupied. I've got a paper in my briefcase to rattle, and San Maya has a steering wheel to twist, and you, Miss Almada... Yes? Well, well, I guess if we get caught exceeding the speed limit, you can always argue in Portuguese with the traffic cop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, among other things. Uh, say, incidentally, what time am I scheduled to take off? Eight o'clock sharp. We're only a few minutes from the dock. Well, now, now, there's a perfect example. Of what, Mr. Cromer? Waste. Genuine waste of the one thing that money cannot buy. Time. No offense, San Maya. No, of course not. Well, look at my watch, Miss Omada. 7.35. 7.35. 25 minutes before my plane leaves, and you say we're just a skip and a jump from being there. Well, now, after all, Mr. Oh, Cromer... I know, I know, I know. Things got a little mixed up. The picture changed. Cloak and dagger and all that. But, <laughs> you know, after all, in my business... I have to meet emergencies like this and on schedule. On schedule, Miss Almada. Well, we will do our best to adhere to your schedule from here on. You know, you know, I think I've finally got your number, Miss Almada. I beg your pardon? I've got your number. I know what you do, what you really do to earn your money. Do you? Yep. You are hired to smooth the ruffled feathers of VIPs like me who come around growling about governmental inefficiency. <laughs> now, Mr. Cromer, <laughs> that is not true. A secretary like you back in New York... She can charm the birds off the trees. Yes, sir. Well, I, I must say, you do it very well. Thank you. However, it is not what I am paid for, Mr. Cromer. I am a secretary. Well, there's no law against doing two jobs at once, young lady. No law in the land. You know, that's what I had in mind when I made this trip. And all the good it did me. How do you mean? Uh, renew old business contacts while I'm running this errand. I have a lot of friends here in Lisbon. Joe Gavin, John Henry. Oh, it is too bad you did not have a chance to see more of them. More of them? I missed John completely and only saw Joe for a minute in the lobby this evening. I am really very sorry. Uh, well, I guess it can't be helped. Oh, uh, we turn here? Yeah, that's right. The ocean is just a few blocks away. Uh, I wish I could have explained to George about that luncheon date tomorrow. Hate to miss it. Well, you may not have to. Oh, no, ma'am. I love Lisbon, but once my job's finished here, I'm heading straight for little old New York. Yes, sir. No stop-offs. When you speak of Mr. Gavin, is that the newspaper man? Mm-hmm. Yep. And the contacts I've made through him. You know, he knows every businessman in Lisbon, every single one. You have a great admiration for businessmen, do you not, Mr. Crom? Well, I ought to. I'm one myself. It's what makes the world go round, Miss Almada. The poets, the poets say it's love, but take it from me. Say, San Maya, I've got a great idea. Stop the car. What? You see that little cafe ahead? Pull up there. Stop the car. Mr. Cromer, I just want to make a phone call. Leave a message back at the hotel for Joe. I'm afraid that would be impossible. Ah, don't you stop worrying about security, Miss Almada. With me, mum is the word. Name, rank, serial number, no more. I know a little bit about these things. But you have to be aboard the plane in 20 minutes. You said it's only a few blocks away. (laughs) Now, let's be fair, Miss Almada. I'm making quite a financial sacrifice to work for my government. I don't think one personal phone call is too much to ask in exchange. Pull over, Mr. Sandmeyer. They weren't taking any chances. Both of them came into the cafe with me. It was crowded and smoky, and there was only one public phone. But I'd gambled and won so far, so I decided to let the bet ride. Very well, Mr. Cromer. Make your call. No, no, you dial the hotel, and I'll tell you the message to leave. I don't want you to fret your pretty little head about anything. As you wish. Hello? I would like to leave a message for a Mr. Joseph Gavin. He what? Hold the line a moment, please. Anything wrong? Mr. Gavin is in the hotel. Uh, come on, let me talk to him. I won't give anything away. And tell you the truth, I'll get a bigger kick out of being mysterious. 
Well, I guess it's all right. Hello. Can you connect me to Mr. Gavin's room, please? Thank you. <laughs> He'll think it's a gag. I'm always kidding him. Hello? Wh who is speaking, please? Would you hold the line, Mr. Gavin? A friend of yours wishes to speak with you. Here. Swell. And be careful what you say. Ah, don't you worry. We can't afford to take chances. Mr. Sandmeyer, if I order one word you don't like, just yank down that receiver. Remember, we're all in this together. Go ahead, Mr. Cromer. We don't have much time. Good enough. Hello, Joe. Cromer. Joe, you old dog. Can't have lunch with you tomorrow after all, Joe. You what? It's out. I wish I could make it, but it's impossible. I just wanted to let you know. Anything wrong? Right, the first time. What is it? I'm going back to the States. You what? Now, don't give me that, Joe. I've got your number. What do you mean? I say I've got your number. Trouble is, you haven't got mine. That's the difference between us. Cromer, uh, you asking me to trace this call? Yeah, but I can't make it for lunch. The police are here. We'll put a trace around it right away. Trace this call right now. Can anyone at your end hear what I'm saying? No, and I'm afraid I'm going to miss seeing John, too. John? It's John Henry, I told you I was looking for. I guess I'm out of luck. You mean the president's signature? You're stalling for time. No question about it. That's a very important commodity, Joe. What have you got? Half an hour? Oh, I wouldn't go that high. Well, like 15 minutes. Yeah, that's better. If you get in at that figure, you may hit the jackpot. Like in Las Vegas with a slot machine. Mr. Cromer, I'm afraid we have to go. Yeah, you bet. It looks like I've got to sign off, Joe. Cromer, Cromer, wait a minute. Uh, don't forget how that jackpot pays. And drop me a line when you get a chance. So long, Joe. Thanks much, folks. I guess we can get going now. Yes. I think we had better. For a moment, I thought Sanmai had seen it. He seemed to be staring at the phone as I stepped away and followed Miss Almada back through the cafe toward the front door. He said nothing when we got outside, nor during the short drive that took us the rest of the way to the waterfront. I looked at my watch as we pulled to a stop in front of a small boathouse at the foot of the deserted pier. Seventeen minutes to eight. The inside of the place smelled like a fish market, and the boat slip was deserted, so we sat down to wait. Another five minutes passed, then ten. Things were beginning to look black. Mr. Cromer, is the dampness bothering you? Yeah, a little bit. I noticed you were shivering. Uh, I guess I'm just a little anxious to get underway. Oh, of course, I understand. Delays always make me nervous. Now, the launch would be along any minute now. I don't see any lights out there. No, it won't be running any. You uh, care for a cigarette, Mr. Cromer? Uh, thanks. I got a pack of my own brand right here. Fine. Listen. Yeah, she's right on schedule. At the launch? Uh-huh. Here's a light, Mr. Cromer. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, Mr. Cromer, you dropped something. Hmm? That piece of paper out of your pocket. Yeah, I got it. Oh, yeah, that note from Joe Gavin. I'll, I'll take it, Samuel. Just a second. Now, look here. That's personal correspondence. What's the matter? He knows we're not from the embassy. He can't. Well, read it yourself. His phone call to Mr. Gavin was a signal. Ben Meyer, I can't imagine what you're getting at. You almost tricked us, Mr. Cromer. Almost, but not quite. Come on, get up to the slip there. You're going for a little boat ride. motor launch pulled alongside, and I got in the front seat next to the man at the wheel. Sand my head of my portfolio to a second man in the back. And a few moments later, we were headed out toward open water. As far as I could see, it was all over but the shooting. Mr. Cromer, are you all right? Oh, just grand. Permit me to introduce myself. Sergeant Valdez, Lisbon Police, Harbor Patrol. The police? We were able to trace your call to the cafe and with ship to shore radio. The rest was easy. You... You mean I'm safe? See, si. And by now, your captors are in custody. Holy cats, you guys are marvelous. Oh, that was quite clever, leaving Mr. Gavin's envelope in the coin return slot of the phone in the cafe in order to keep the line open so that we could trace the call. Yeah, I had a, had a little trouble folding it with one hand. <laughs> Very clever indeed. Don't forget how the jackpot pays. Mr. Gavin had some trouble with that one. Well, I'm, I'm glad he finally figured it out. Oh, he is a smart one. Tell me, is that really how the slot machines work in Las Vegas? The following afternoon, I was taken aboard a cruiser, and at exactly 2.36... I laid my copy of the Boboya Def Asylum Act on a wide mahogany desk and handed a pen to the man seated behind it. 
If you'll sign there, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And now to our hostess, Jeanette MacDonald, and our star, Barry Sullivan. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Uh, do you know what I was thinking, Barry? Uh, what, Jeanette? When you stop to think about it, anything can be a prayer. Anything. A sob, a tear, a cry for help, a shout of joy. Mm -hmm. you, you just can't rule the heart's desire into a rigid form when asking for God's help. That's why I guess our, our whole language is sort of embedded with little prayers. They're in our greetings, our partings, our exclamations, our lovemaking, even in some of our Christian and family names, and of course, in our songs. Uh, Jeanette, you mean we more or less accidentally call on God each day lots of times without remembering that we're doing it? Mm-hmm, that's yeah. just what I mean, Barry. We get the ready-made prayers in our language from our ancestors. Their very lives were constant prayer, crossing the ocean, conquering a new land, fighting the Indians. To that constant prayer, they owed survival. And we owe our country. That's true. Yes. They never left God out of a moment of their daily lives. It's shocking to realize how much we take for granted today. How often we forget to let God into our daily lives. You're saying that nowadays prayers have become a sort of a, a lost art. Well, Barry, prayers are not an art to me. They're the heart of living. And certainly we haven't lost heart. We just need more and more of it. Yeah, and of course, there's nothing to prevent us from attuning our ears to a little, uh, uh, what did you call them, Jeanette? Was it the embedded prayers? <laughs> you put it very nicely, Barry. Uh -huh. <laughs> the embedded prayers. Well, that's a good start toward bringing back to our daily life what we might call the missing prayers. Well, why shouldn't we call them the sleeping prayers? Anyone who thinks about them can wake them up and make them real prayers again the instant he alerts his ears and his heart. You got the message, Barry. Just on time. It is time, you know. Time to say? The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. <laughs> Hollywood Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Dotted Line, starring Perry Sullivan. Jeanette McDonald was your hostess. Others in our cast were Jack Crucian, John Larch, Lillian Bayef, Herb Ellis, and Jay Novello. The script was written by John T. Kelly and was directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugo Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Today is Sunday, starring Robert Stack. Jean Crane will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. Mm -hmm.